Hi everyone, Charles from The Food People here. I hope you're all keeping safe and well. It's my great pleasure to welcome chef, writer and developer James Strawbridge. James has, is joining me today to talk about his sustainable living philosophy, the techniques to live, cook and eat in harmony with nature, the nuances of seasonal food sourcing and his love of outdoor cooking. In addition, he'll be discussing uh, the UK food culture as it stands at the moment and his hopes for our future food system. So welcome, James. Thank you so much for joining me today as part of the Food People in Conversation with. Lovely to be here, Charles. Great to have you. Um, at, at the Food People, we're very clear about why we do what we do. We are champions of change driven every day by our intent, which is to shift the future of food and drink by harnessing the power of trends. And in this In Conversation With series, it's all about talking to others across the spectrum of food and drink to find out more about why they do what they do, how they can inspire us, how in their way they're championing change and shifting the future of food and drink. James, brilliant to have you here today. A pleasure to be talking to you on this wonderful sunny and actually coincidentally what is um, World Earth Day to talk about sustainable um, living and sustainable food. Um, if I can start with a, um, a sort of a broad and opening question, you're a chef, you're in development, you're a writer, photographer, by uh, we can see there uh, the, um, the lenses and so on next okay. to you, you're an author, but where did your journey with food begin? Can you, can you just give us a bit of insight into that? Yeah, I think um, like many people who sort of work in the food industry, it really started uh, as my first job um, washing pots and pans um, at my local sort of um, country retreat hotel. Um, mm -hmm. and I didn't enjoy it greatly as a, as a KP, but I worked hard. Um, I then went away to university to study environmental history. Mm -hmm. um, and whilst at university, I um, started working in kitchens. Um, and that very quickly overtook academia in terms of a, a good way to earn a living, <laughs> but also I found it a very creative outlet. Yeah. Um, so I became very keen on cookery. And then I think as I left university, started a, a sustainable living uh, family ob doc uh, with my family. Mm -hmm. And that was on BBC Two. And it was all around going self-sufficient. Yeah. Um, and my dad who's a very, very large character sort of, um, he was doing the eco engineering. I did an awful lot of the, the digging and the growing of the food along yeah. with the rest of the family. So my experience very quickly went from a kitchen to the, the small holding and, mm -hmm. and we did everything, you know, grew all sorts of different produce and reared all of our own animals, butchered them on site. So it was, it was kind of a baptism of fire at that point. And then since then I've, I've sort of gone, gone on to lots of different things in, in the food sector. What a, f a fascinating, a fascinating journey. Um, what would you say is the common thread that joins up the work that you do? I mean, chefs, as, as we know, and it, it can be a um, this kind of grand term around purpose or philosophy. But how do you describe your the why behind what you do? And I'm, I'm guessing there's some threads of some of the bits you've just spoken about there. But how would you kind of articulate that? My, my philosophy tends to be very family focused yeah um, and that also then leads on to things that are close to home so local food your local community uh, thinking about the plots and what you can grow yourself so very much a little bit of a a starting small sort of mm -hmm. in terms of my scope and the way I work and then have a slight side which is a bit of a kitchen rebel. I like being disruptive, not for the sake of it, but I love innovation and I love yeah. change. Yeah. So I think that's quite a key part of my philosophy. Um, and then other elements, obviously sustainability um, stroke, you know, thinking about the environment and our place within it. Yeah. I've got a real passion for approaching my work whilst retaining my my values um, yeah, okay. that's another big part of it um, but I think it, I suppose in essence it's also about a lifestyle where I I live to work and I work to live but where the balance feels that um, I'm modeling something for my family and my children to see not you know daddy going off to the kitchen getting grumpy but instead you know being buzzing with with enthusiasm and that's so I try and make sure I enjoy my work if that if that counts as a value I don't know but yeah so if that's your why then I guess the next question is what's your what what do you see as the kind of key pillars to 
living and cooking more sustainably? Um, I think for me, it's about seasonality yeah. and local, but not just, um, you know, when there's British asparagus, which is great, or, you know, Cornish lo local asparagus is always a top pick. Yeah. But beyond that, thinking about how does your diet change over the year, um, not being afraid in winter of, you know, stocking up on a few more carbs and having some slow cooked local meat and stuff. But in the spring and summer, um, getting quite fresh meals. So being very inspired by the ingredient. Yeah. Um, and then I think it's all about waste as well. So, um, you know, I've always composted. I've had got wormeries in the garden and and I think but it's more than just feeding your compost bin the scraps. It's using all of those, um, you know, shoots and roots to to incorporate into your meal planning. Um, and I think and, and meal planning is a big one as well. It's, I approach my food and my work with a degree of organization that's verges on on like, you know, OCD to the extreme. Everything I do is planned. And that yep. means that there's very little waste. We, we sort of, yes, sometimes I can be spontaneous and make myself a yummy sandwich, but <laughs> most of the time I know what I'm cooking and therefore I don't have waste in the kitchen. Um, Give us, can you can you give us an example of, of that? And, and you touched on then a, a moment ago then about, you know, using you know the roots and so it's not just about feeding the compost, but trying to make the most of um, the in, the inherent value that comes from the kind of root to stem. Are there are there any kind of great examples that you can give us of um, of, of that that are yeah, kind of practical? Well, I mean I, I've just I've, I've, well typical you know do a plug quickly but I've written a book on zero waste veg cooking out this September with DK so yeah I've got several examples um, <laughs> but say for example say um, I've got peas I'm doing a podcast tomorrow on peas and they you've got the shoots obviously garnish very chefy uh, yeah. you've got the pod you've got um, the leaves the stems you know and then the obviously the sweet peas themselves so yeah. there's all sorts of ways to use those different components and I think um, you know in terms of pods that are a bit tougher and, and again this I suppose ties into something you know we're going to hopefully chat about but micro seasons and the way that from the beginning of a vegetable season to the end you've got different parts of the plant that you need to be creative to learn how to use so yeah. Um, if a pea pod is really tough and sinewy, then, you know, marinating it or, or just finishing it on the grill with a bit of charcoal embers underneath so that it blisters and sweetens, softens down. Yeah, it's a great way of incorporating it or make pea pod wine. My, my granny was a WI champion of Ireland for her <laughs> pea pod wine. So I've grown up like with fairly wacky you know, examples of always using everything. And, and it is thrifty or frugal. Who knows what's going to happen in the economy and five years time so these skills save money but they you know help reduce your impact on the environment at the same time yeah okay and you mentioned local then a few moments ago what does you know what does what does kind of local mean for you it's a it's a term that is kind of used a lot within food and drink you know, what does just eating and, and and cooking locally what does that mean for you so i think um there, there are times when I will, you know, use grains and things that are imported or, or pulses. But a lot of the time, what I try to do is adopt a very um, Cornish sort of circle of ingredients. So when I want shellfish, um, I step out my front door, I walk sort of 400 meters down a hill to the river. And, uh, and then the mussels and oysters and anything like that gets sent across on a ferry and I pick it up and I bring it home. Yeah. So that's shellfish is, is here, right, right on the river foy. Um, cheese, you know, Cornish cheese. Um, I've got, you know, lovely uh, Cornish Gouda company next door to me, a guy called Giel, who I get on really well with. Yeah. So he he will, you know, I'll pop round to his son will have a go on his tractor with 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 Giel's dad and, and I'll pick up some cheese. Um, but pretty much like veg, I'll uh, get Riverford, so tends to be a seasonal local when it can be, sometimes from their other organic farms. But uh, the networking all in all comes down to loads and loads of time spent traveling the Cornish coast and the county meeting people. Yeah. Uh, I try and work with a lot of those suppliers and producers um, to help develop recipes and do content sort of recipe you know, photographs and things. 
But I think it's really it's about an awareness of who's where yeah. and how to get hold of good ingredients. And then I I try to rely on that for most of my food. Um, the other key thing about local, as mentioned at the top of this, is like it's it's close to home. It's in the garden, like as yeah, local okay. as I can get. So we grow our own food, um, and then beyond that, it's a bit of foraging. Um, local farmers market has just opened again, um, which is great news. So yeah, right. really so taking it quite quite literally, the local thing, but yeah. also uh, acknowledge, acknowledging when something is is tasty and comes from England or Devon over yeah, the border yeah. with you guys. Um, yeah. That that is also I'm, I'm not afraid of going a little bit more southwest when when you need to. Yeah, we're thinking about. Uh, cooking in the kitchen are there particular techniques that you use in the, the kitchen to add value to raw ingredients that also help you to mitigate waste are there a kind of i'm imagining there's a bit of a toolkit of uh techniques if you like can you can you bring those to life for us yeah so i mean as a development chef i do quite a lot of it's sort of like a, an added value alchemy challenge where you're given a, a, a kilo of a raw ingredient and you've got to make these people some money by finding ways to diversify. So say say if you're taking something just simple um, like veg or, you know, it's it starts off for me about a butchery approach. How do you break down your ingredients into its best cuts? And you've got yeah. prime cuts in there and then you've got the lesser known forgotten elements, which, you know, on a on a mackerel it could be the the skin or you know you look at um on a celeriac it could be the peel you know yeah. uh, or the tops and yeah. then using preserving methods and artisan sort of techniques of how to you know to elevate something and a lot of the time that will come down to using something simple like salt so yeah. um by curing it brining it fermenting it Sometimes it will be about dehydration and, uh -huh. and drying something. Um, other times it could be, you know, knowing how to cook it in its in its way to pull out the best of the flavor. So I think adding value to ingredients partly comes down to understanding process and the, yeah. and the the difference between one part and another of, of that ingredient. The other element is innovation and color and excitement. And I think trying to look at something with a fresh perspective so, mm -hmm. so very often as a consultant or, or a development chef you can look at someone's raw ingredient or their menu or their their product in with a fresh set of eyes and yeah. that means you can get really you know excited about the opportunities and the possibilities and I think that's where I'm better suited as a, as a chef rather than uh, sometimes if you're very close to a product and I've done this with my own business in the past you can get bogged down in in the detail rather than that blue sky moment where you get to you know dream about what you want to cook <laughs> yeah what what's a really favorite example of yours of um i, I don't know a, a a technique that you apply to a certain food that um you know perhaps you wouldn't ordinarily think of or something yeah um i think probably uh smoke is really interesting yeah. because but, but not just you know brisket um smoked mackerel but you know smoking uh smoking butter using uh apple wood shavings to smoke yeah. scallops um yeah. smoking you know things that you you don't necessarily as associate with that smoky flavor but if it's done subtly it can really enhance a dish um so i and i think that's also great because it it involves that um you know fire the, the greatest transformation with food tends to come from fire yeah. um, so smoke is one and then another one would just be uh, probably seasoning with fermented powders is another yeah one. okay so yeah I, i'll make some kimchi or some kraut dehydrate it blitz it up and then use that as a seasoning yeah, and it's just so oh it's just lovely it's like it's you know it's, it's something people won't know what they're eating until you tell them but no it gives real umami pack i was just about to yeah. say i can imagine that gives a incredibly deep long-lasting umami flavor yeah. yeah and it's and it's just you know a colorful little pinch of a powder and it makes all the difference so. that's really interesting I'm, I'm definitely going to give that a go not something i've thought of before either that's brilliant um a few moments ago, you know, you were talking about how um, in your 
in your world it's about you know if you're wanting shellfish going down to the banks of the foy and that kind of thing can do you think you can also live cook and eat more sustainably anywhere um you know many of the people that are, are listening to this are going to be living in an urban environment so what are your what are your thoughts on how you can how you can imply it in that kind of context yeah i think that um urban environment in terms of reducing your impact eating locally there's a vast amount of added value local opportunities um, and that's where people might be doing really creative artisan skills in a city so that that is one way of supporting local um, food industry in terms of local ingredients the the un-PC but the blunt answer is you just can't be as local in a city as you can in the country uh -huh. and people don't normally say that because they're always like oh yeah you could forage in the city and you can go foraging but a lot of it will be hand pollution and it'll be not quite the same as the Cornish lanes so there's a reality check there but and you've got to think more creatively what is local to you yeah. so if you're think, talking about London you've got the M25 you've got the southeast in the southeast there is you know we're biased in the southwest but there's some of the best food in the country down Absolutely. there or the north of england you know manchester liverpool these places are surrounded by incredible ingredients so i think it's it's about seeing local and seasonal as you know what is viable and how far do you have to go yeah so hyper local and i'm really fortunate where i am where i could choose to eat super super local apart from maybe in the hungry gap um which we've just gone through where you need food from elsewhere at the moment really yeah um, but i think that in terms of an urban diet you can be local you subsidize it with with super hyper local uh, foraging and craft food that people are doing in cities um, and there are all sorts of interesting city farms and growers yeah, but the reality is don't you know feel guilty if you're actually looking in your region of the uk because that's what we need to support i think yeah. as well especially everything that's happened recently. We need to like, you need to look a little bit further away than maybe when people were talking about food miles five years ago. And we now just, I think, need to support our food, our wider food network. Yeah, our kind of uh, our, our regional food network as opposed to our, if it's you know not feasible, the hyper, hyper local one. Yeah, I think so. Um, you also, I know you're hugely passionate, obviously, about seasonal cooking and eating. Can, and how ingredients change. And you have touched on this already the, through, from the early through to the late season. Mm -hmm. How do you find that if you took a particular ingredient, you know, how, how do they change? And, and therefore, how does that change what you can do with them? Yeah, I mean, I think the seasonality, we're now pretty familiar almost with a, you know, spring, summer, autumn, winter vibe around fruit and veg and even, you know, um, seafood, elements of sustain seasonal sustainable eating when you actually dig a bit further and if you're an experienced gardener or grower mm -hmm. or just keen chef you'll be aware that say a broad bean in its uh, early season is well you first of all you've got the tops which you yeah. can make wonderful you know garnish and pestos and, and saute them with a little bit of oil lemon lovely product the, the beans themselves are so soft skins, you can just eat them raw, cook them for a second, you don't need to peel them. Then you go through the later season where they become quite bitter and fibrous and many people will, you know, shell, shell the beans from the pod and then cook them. Um, I think that it, there's also little things like, you know, the bean, the bean tops themselves, you get black fly when you're growing them if you don't get rid of them at a certain point. And also they'll become quite tough and need a lot more cooking. So any vegetable um, or, or fruit has a, a micro season that as you become attuned to it, it starts to provide exciting new ways to cook. Mm -hmm. And instead of just treating, you know, a beetroot like a beetroot, you can um, use, you know, very light pickles for a baby beetroot, whereas you might want to slow roast or, or cook on coals for dirty beets when it gets a bit rough and tougher you know yeah. um so i do think that there is almost an awareness that's growing around the the the, the seasonality of a, of a veg within its season so yeah. you know, there's further to dig down and, and delve into the beets is a really good example actually because we had some actually in our vegetable patch that were actually left over from last year's planting and yeah. 
I have to admit, some of them did end up on the compost. But yeah. th what would you recommend um, that I would have uh, done with those? What, put them on a fire or something like that? Fire cook them? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, beet beetroots, if you, don't, if you cook them on the fire, get them so they're all blackened, and then you can basically use a teaspoon, carve yeah. them out. They're wonderful and sweet, take on a woody aroma. Um, I think the other thing would maybe be to to use that they'll have very limited sugars compared to maybe um, earlier in the season. But in breads, if you if you, you grate it, mix it in with a dough, a beetroot bread is a wonderful thing, you know, with a nice bit of cured salmon and some horseradish mayo or something. It's it's yeah. I think, yeah, using using them in creative ways, I, I probably would also just, you know, turn them into a real robust spice chutney. Yeah, um, cool. Again, because they can handle those sweetness yeah. from and, and acidity from vinegar. Um, but yeah, there's some vegetables that when when they get to that point in the season, you you have to you know make the decision: Are you going to cook them or are you going to compost them? Yeah. Um, and I think there is always a cooking option, but sometimes you've also got to remember soil health and nutrition. Yeah. If you are composting, that's not the end of the world. It's no. it's kind of but it is wasteful. So it's a, it's a bit of both. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm picking up from the way that you're talking about the way you cook and eat that you're, you're much more biased towards um, vegetables and plants uh, and so on. Would you describe the way you live and cook as being flexitarian? Um, oh, well, it's a bit like, you know, would I describe myself as a hipster? I, I, would, I wouldn't necessarily, but I probably am. Um, I think flexitarian is a useful guide for people who are eating less meat and fish and thinking about their diets. But the, what I don't like about it is, is it somehow it says that I am, you know, I'm flexible with the way I approach food. And I'm, I'm the opposite of that. I, I sort of am quite un, uncompromising with my yeah, choices. Okay. So my choices are all about higher welfare meats, um, you know, wild fish caught off the Cornish coast, uh, supporting local business that is, is responsible and regenerative with its farming. So, and the fact that I love cooking vegetables shouldn't be a reason to maybe put a label as flexitarian because vegetables are, you know, the majority of what I cook. Um, but I think that, for me, maybe it's it's a little bit um, more with a focus on UK um, and British local food, uh -huh. and therefore probably I mean it's really is one of my favourite restaurants, um, which is the perfect word as well. Native is yeah. have you seen you know uh, Ivan and Imogen who've got this restaurant's just opened Browns I think now, yeah. uh, London. But that that word native, it's like if it's if it's native and if it's wild. And if it's seasonal, then I'm in, you know, yeah. and I don't know what we call that yet, but I'm sure yeah. you've got, you'll have a name for it. And <laughs> I, I will, I will wear that tag, but flexitarian, I'm, I think is a term that's always evolving and I, I'm not sure I like it for me, but yeah. Okay. No, that's interesting. So we, uh, you're not saying that you don't eat meat, but when you do, what is it that, what your kind of guiding principles around kind of sourcing and, uh, and ethics and that kind of thing? Yeah. Well, generally, I suppose in its hierarchy, uh, the the best position for me is when I know the farmer. I know exactly where it's come from, um, which where I am is is quite easy to do, which is great. Um, so had some lovely lamb from on Dartmoor. Got some venison just from near, near Launceston. So um, there, there's different options for direct from the farm, um, and those farms themselves would either be organic or very much grass fed, mm -hmm. uh, low impact farming. Um, and then beyond that, I think organic as a label is something I, I, I believe very strongly in and, and even MSC, the sea spiracy stuff that broke recently. And, but I, I work directly with quite a lot of uh, the fishing communities and, and the fisheries down in New Lynn, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Lou is just on my doorstep. Yeah. So I'm a big supporter of fish as well. Um, and I think it's all about responsible responsible catch um and higher welfare meats um yeah. at the moment all i've got are chickens who lay eggs so they're useless <laughs> although i get <laughs> eggs is you know I, I have had goats and pigs and ducks and turkeys and stuff previously um and i think i'm comfortable in killing and eating my own food which yeah. is also a challenge that's the gauge if you are willing to do that yeah 
then it gives you a very informed position to go shopping. Um, yeah. And I think that I've grown up with that culture. So it puts my decision making in, in a first hand experience. I think. Yeah. OK. Yeah. No, that is that is yeah, super interesting. Um, I know that you and I do as well um, love to cook outdoors and over fire. And I just really wanted to ask you, what is it about that for you that gets you really excited? OK. Um, oh, I think it's the lack of control. Like and and I I'm experienced enough to be able to manage many types of fire and stove and, you know, I've done vast amounts of outdoor cookery cooking but it's the the unquantifiable lack of precision that you can get in a normal kitchen where it opens up therefore like your timing is more fluid your yeah. your approach and the opportunity to add a little bit more you know uh some wood chips that are going to release yeah. lovely volatile smoke compounds onto yeah. the food the 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 you know the the patience involved as well you have to set your time thing yeah. and just chill and go with the fire go with the process yeah. rather than having this very human you know i'm going to do this now in this order it, yeah. you have to just take it a little bit more easy yeah. um so I, everything about it i absolutely love i think it's also a great leveler um for families and yeah. and cooks to come back together around a fire to cook rather than this you know up on your workbench at a certain height that the children can't quite see yeah. um, uh, in a way that is quite regimented it just it it creates less boundaries and i, I think that's a really nice thing garden parties are going to go nuts this year and i think it's, it's all the best yeah yeah definitely and food i don't know about you but I, I just find food just seems to taste better in the context of nature and fresh air uh, I, I don't know what it is about it but it just does <laughs> completely i mean i think i think partly it's it's almost acoustics you know whether you're eating out of a wooden bowl when when you scrape a wooden bowl it doesn't do this sort of clinky noise instead yeah. it's just smooth and quieter and i think when you're eating outside you don't have the whir of an extractor fan you don't yeah. have um, the scrape of chairs and tables sometimes you've just got you know a bit of nature and or you know the sound of in a, a balcony of some traffic and things going by but it's 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 a larger soundscape so yes. your focus therefore is sort of nulled to that and on the food and then I think aroma and smell wise you you've allowed the heat source to to touch the food rather than having these pans and barriers and yeah. gas and electric and conduction like all that's gone and instead the two have come together yeah. to 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 make it taste better i think <laughs> yeah no definitely i completely completely agree um one of the things i wanted to ask you about obviously you know we're now starting to move out of the covid in era into a kind of reset time i guess mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's it's great to see hospitality starting to open back up again. What do you see as the, some of the negative, but also the positive influence and impacts that COVID's had on our food landscape and our relationship with food? Yeah, okay. Um, I think positives for me probably come down to people who weren't necessarily cooking mm -hmm. as much. Yeah. Um, have got into the kitchen and are, are cooking from scratch more often. So that's a massive trend. I think that's all for the best. Um, I think downsides, um, obviously reliance on, I mean, where I live, you, you have to either cross a ferry to try and go get um, a restaurant meal or you have to travel for half an hour. So I'm in the middle of nowhere. So, yeah. so I can't really easily get food, but I think the downside of these delivery services is maybe that people are getting easy options that maybe aren't as healthy sometimes. Yeah. Um, I think that the the food food service and restaurant trade and and I think that's been diabolical the way it's been treated. So I think that's very very sad. Um, I think in terms of a reset, one element of that which I think is hopeful is we're having to reassess what what and why we go out to eat yeah. and i think part of that comes down to not just to be impressed by talented chefs and their mm -hmm. skills in the kitchen 
uh, because a lot of people at home have learned that they're actually quite good at cooking if they follow follow the guidance or or get good ingredients so it's for more than that it's for a sense of occasion it's for community it's for friends gathering and it's for maybe excitement about what is new and inspiring and therefore yeah. people's menus might not just fall back on what they were doing pre yeah. pre all of this they might push the boundaries try and position themselves as more of an identity or a tribe connection with their with their diner yeah um and i think that's exciting um but i think it's primarily there's been quite a lot of bad i think the the positives will are yet to be seen but hopefully it's all about more people cooking because I, yeah. I i think that's a, a good a good outcome yeah yeah definitely where do you or how do you see the British food culture right now and, and have you seen it change? I mean, it was all about um, London, top chefs. How do you see that kind of influence changing and evolving? I, I think uh, like many regional chefs have been guilty in the past of looking to through through Instagram, through, you know, um, Michelin Guide, through looking at London restaurants in the scene of being inspired. Yeah. And that's still the case. There's still obviously a huge amount of super uber talented chefs in cities. Um, but where I feel in recent years, there's a shift is that regionally we are at the forefront of most of the ingredients and the seasonality around being able to visit where the food comes from how it's produced and getting it fresh yeah so what that does it means that when there's a new you know when kaylets like lovely little kaylets got sort of popular like you know they were on in, on the doorstep and I've, yeah. I've been cooking with them for years or when when you have uh, a fishmonger starting to sell hake throats because they're a forgotten fish that is really great you know you, you end up getting that knowledge quite early yeah. uh, and where the trend has maybe changed i think probably the pioneer for me recently is is tom adams and coom's head and that sort of yeah countryside setup of yeah. a restaurant theme um yeah. and there's um yeah lots of other people like that who are just doing very low impact off the grid type trends and i think you know from from knowledge quite a few of the chefs that i chat to you know come to cornwall or other regions of the uk for inspiration because it's got something quite fresh happening at the moment um so it's almost like there is a, a change on its way um and i think maybe it's less about everybody trying to be the same there's yeah. there's cornwall is or, or or any you know region is not trying to copy a london scene they're trying to come up with their own identity so it's almost and that's across the board with i think a lot of identity in communities it's almost becoming um less homogenous and and more independent and i think that's fascinating for food um and i i, I think very hopeful for more more exciting things to come from all around yeah it feels like there's a real air of permissibility to 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 be different and and hero the the nuances rather than just being um yeah ubiquitous and you know everybody trying to be the same I, no i completely agree and i think um what's happening in cornwall and other regional parts of the uk as well as really there's some incredible examples of that happening yeah when you look to the future of food how important is it to consider the past and and, and the influence that comes from the past when you then think about what is the, what's likely to happen in the in the future and I, I, I know that you've been working on uh, some series looking back at sort of historical food culture and food anthropology and so on so yeah what are your thoughts on that yeah I mean I, I find it um, fascinating um, I think primarily because very often and again chefs were guilty sometimes of um trying to be different for the sake of it and putting a twist on something when you don't need to because yeah. it's bloody great so and then other times it's almost like you know not moving forward and relying on on the past so but i think when you look back at the national treasures from around the uk and and this food food anthropology like you can learn so many things about ingredients cultural traditions ways of cooking um to then take that try it again now add your own character and your own you know modern flavors you know small twists if it's natural to you or yeah. authentic 
um, I think that I think there are massive lessons to learn from the past of our cooking. Uh, I think the French have done it to such a degree with classical French cuisine, where it's yeah. potentially it it's a bit restrained by yeah. its own success. Yeah. Um, whereas modern British means you can look back around the world for inspiration, and then update it with a a respectful you know approach of saying this is my food now and it's but it's very much inspired by everything that's come before so i think it's like roots in the past but then modern perspective makes a tastier plate you know yeah okay no i really like really really like that if you could give uh, i just want to go back to sort of sustainable um living and, and cooking and eating if you could share kind of five tips for our audience on if you want to make some steps in this direction these are here are five things that you should do or consider what would they be for you firstly again um it's an unpopular one but probably eat slightly less um it's kind yeah. of lockdown belly i sort of like yeah just yeah, ever just eating a little smaller portions i think is one good thing um next plan your meals mm -hmm. um and that means that you're you know you're able to manage your supplies in your kitchen your fridge your larder yeah. better i think um subscribe to a veg box or have weekly vegetables that are in season because yeah. that dictates your meal planning slightly in order to be healthier and less reliant on processed food yeah um and then um zero waste approach like in a nutshell either compost or use the scraps in creative ways so celeriac use the the skin peel to make a really umami rich stock base you know roast it off use the leaves to make a nice celeriac leaf oil um, mm -hmm. use the little knobbly gnarly roots and fry them off as a snack you know yeah. so, okay. so be conscientious and then finally it's a really funny one but that your oven when you turn on your oven you use electricity now i source our electricity from solar and, and renewables but if if and how your energy impacts on your cooking, if your oven is preheating, use it to start drying something or heat your skillet in it so it gets up to temperature. Yeah, or okay. roast off some red peppers to use the next day for your pizza topping. Yeah. Um, and when your oven is finished, don't just turn it off. Use it almost like a hay box where it's an insulated warm space. So use that to again, you know, um, toast off some pine nuts or whatever yeah, it is for your next something. meal so i think you use your oven more intelligently is, is the only final thing i think of here no brilliant that's fantastic and, and just one final question if you through your all the different aspects of the work that you do if you could have a lasting impact on our food system what would you hope that would be well part of me wants to sort of say you know um go down the sustainability route but the other part of me is really what i really want to do when i when i grow up is um is be an artist so i want to paint pictures of ingredients and food and art so if i can not just you know produce pretty photos of, of plates of food but i want to be like a, a food art person and i don't know what that legacy or what that would look like but if one day if i can just you know paint or inspire things with with art and food mixed together that's what i really want to do in the future so it's not quite answering the question but you know what i mean it's just it's something to do with art basically well there's a, a lovely connection there around inspiration and creativity and yeah i mean there are a lot of parallels that we could draw between the world of art and and and, and food and culinary that is absolutely for sure so that concludes this episode of the Food People In Conversation with James on behalf of us all of the Food People and the In Conversation with audience. Thank you so much for joining me today. Absolute pleasure to speak to you. I think you've inspired us all, made us think. Um, it's been great to uh, talk to you. So thanks very much for joining. My pleasure. Thank you. So do join our TFP community for the details of our latest In Conversation with episodes, as well as the latest free to access food and drink trends for site. Visit the foodpeople.co.uk and complete your details at the footer of the page. So on behalf of James and myself, thanks for listening to the Food People In Conversation with. I just leave you with one question as always. How are you shifting the future of food and drink? Thanks for listening.